So there are little polyps in there, but this coral doesn't build reefs. It bends with the water. Um, it's a, it's a, relati a relative of reef building corals. Um, if we move over, how about this animal? Is this a coral? Yeah, a lot more people. This is what we would call the common name is a sea whip. It's another soft coral. It's more closely related to the sea fans. These also bend with the water. They don't build reefs or anything like that, but they are technically a type of soft coral. <clears throat> and what about this over here? Yeah, a few more people. This is what we might call like a boulder or a brain coral. These are hard corals. They're an entire different classification of coral. And these, it looks like a rock. When you're swimming around, you might just think it's a rock, if it's, especially if it's brown. Most Caribbean corals are brown. Um, but this is what a, a coral looks like. Um, and these are the type that build reefs. So um, I mentioned this might be an example of like a boulder brain coral. And I know that there's some boulders corals in the audience. So I'm going to introduce each of you to the type of coral that you are. So the boulder corals, there's a few different species of them all in the Orbicella genus. But these form, as you can imagine, like big boulders. But really, they can form like big mountains. And they're huge plating brown. And they form these big reefs. These are some of the iconic reef builders in the Caribbean. They form these massive reef structures with a lot of different nooks and crannies that fish and invertebrates can live in. They provide a lot of habitat. But they are pretty sensitive to temperature, to heat rising, to disease. Um, there, yeah, that's the boulder corals. There's some star corals I saw in the audience too. So these are, I think, actually called the great star coral, but the species Montessia cavernosa. These are a charismatic smaller coral. They don't get as big as the boulders, but they're very cute and they have these big fleshy polyps and at night their tentacles come out and they're really big. They're just a very charismatic coral. Um, they grow to be maybe about like this big, but they are hard and they do grow on reefs. They add to the reefs and they are surprisingly resilient where the boulder corals might be bleaching and dying when it's hotter out. For some reason, these guys do pretty well and they can tolerate the heat a lot better. So mustard hill corals, that's the type of coral I chose to be today. These are a tiny coral. They form tiny little hills. They're a lot softer. They kind of just form a crust. In fact, what, they, what they're really good at is when a coral dies and it just turns into like an eroding sandy rock, these corals will grow as like a crust over the top of them, just in these little blobs. And so they're not very pretty. They don't add a lot of structure. They don't add a lot of habitat for the reef, but um, they, they are, um, around and they form these tiny little yellow blobs that you see all over the reef. So brain corals. Um, brain corals you all might be pretty familiar with. As I listed many species. There's many species of brain corals in the Caribbean. Um, they very obviously look like a brain. Um, they are sensitive to disease, especially in the Caribbean. Um, but otherwise, they're pretty charismatic and I'm sure many of you have heard of them before. And lastly, we have our elkhorn coral. If any of you have ever been swimming in the Caribbean or saw pictures of, of Caribbean reefs, you might have seen pictures of the elkhorn because these are the most iconic. They, sh they make these big red orange branching trees with these like palmated um, branches on them. And they can grow pretty big and form these stands that look like forests. And they used to be all over the near shore parts of the Caribbean. They're really hard to find today because they are really sensitive to so many things, um, temperature, wave energy, and they've just kind of been decimated recently. But these used to be the most iconic um, corals on the reef. So now that I've introduced each of you to the type of coral that you are, I want to show you what I think is some of the coolest things about corals. And that's how they reproduce. So corals can only reproduce once a year. And it happens when they get these specific environmental cues. It'll be the hottest time of the year, usually like August in the Caribbean. It'll be night, it'll be a few hours after sunset, a few days after the full moon, and then the full moon, it'll rise. That's a cue. And then down under the water, the corals are gonna be aware of the temperature, the time after sunset, the full moon, and they're all gonna know at the same time to release all of their gametes into the water. All of their eggs are gonna float to the top, they're gonna mix, and that's how corals breed. 
This is extremely precise, and it's very surprising how they all know how to do it within, when, within like a 20 minute window with each other. Um, so, it, yeah, and it only happens once a year, so these reproduce extremely slowly, and they put out all of these um, gametes to mix up at the surface of the water, which you can imagine is a pretty dangerous place for these um, corals to be growing up. Um, I have a video, um, I took this video of a coral spawning. It's, it's spawning in a tank, which is why it looks really slow. Um, in the ocean, it happens a lot faster. But you can see um, the little bundles are coming out of the polyps and they're slowly floating to the top. Once they get to the top, they just drift away with the current. Um, and each of these bundles will hold like maybe like 100 eggs in them and they'll just be um, broken up by the waves and they'll just grow into little larvae at that point. So, I would like to, for each of you to imagine that you are this little larvae. You guys, like the coral spawned last night, it's been a few hours, you're now a little larvae, you are at the surface of the ocean, you're just drifting along with the waves, and now you've suddenly gotten the environmental cue you've developed, you know you need to dive, and you need to find a place to live. But when you dive down, there's so many places you could choose to live, and it's really important where you choose to live because once you decide this is where you're gonna stay, you can't move. You're gonna calcify yourself down to the ground and you're gonna weather out everything that the environment goes through, every, all the changes, you can't move. You either survive there or you die. So it's very important where you decide to stay. So, I have this QR code again in case you need it, but if you have an exit out of your screen, you should still be able to have it. Um, if you're on the screen, you can go ahead and choose where you're gonna settle. Unfortunately, you can't settle up in the water. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. A few of you that are settling in the water, you guys can just keep drifting away. Um, but otherwise, Remember where you decided to settle, because now you're gonna calcify yourself, you're gonna grow into your little polyp, you're gonna grow out your little tentacles, and then you're gonna butt off and have your little other polyps, you're gonna start growing as a coral on this reef. But it's 1985, and suddenly there's a lionfish invasion. These lionfish came from the Pacific, they aren't native here, and they have no natural predators here because they're extremely toxic, and many things are afraid to touch them and they eat everything that can fit in their mouth, everything that's smaller than them. So they're gonna just decimate the herbivores on the reef. They're gonna eat every herbivore. And as a result, everybody who lives in these upper parts right here that are really exposed to the sun, you're gonna get overgrown by algae. It's gonna grow way faster than you. You're not gonna have a chance to keep up and I'm really sorry, but you'll perish. <laughs> <laughs> so the rest of you can continue on living. Um, continue growing as coral. It's now 2014. There's a new coral disease. All of these are real, by the way. This is called stony coral tissue loss disease. It started in Miami. It's been spreading its way down the Caribbean. Unfortunately, all brain corals are extremely susceptible. When they catch it, there's nearly a 100% chance they're gonna die. So, unfortunately, if any brain corals are out there, you guys don't survive 2014. Unless, if you guys were able to make a bracelet, um, there was um, some bracelets out there that you could string together some of the um, adaptations on there. You guys will be saved if you have the disease resistance gene. If any of you have that in your brain coral or any other type of coral, you guys survive this. You guys are good. But everybody else, you guys just keep living. You guys are fine. It's 2017 now and Hurricane Irma hits. And this is just gonna kick up all of the winds, gonna kick up all of the wave energy. It's gonna start blasting the shores with waves. All of you elkhorns that used to be protecting the shoreline with all of your branches, you guys are used to the normal amount of wave energy. This is just gonna pummel you. You guys are gonna break apart, you're gonna roll away, and unfortunately none of the elkhorns are gonna survive this. So everybody else that's left, you guys can keep living, keep surviving, um, keep growing. And now it's 2023. Many of you might have heard about this, but last year, last summer, was the hottest temperatures on record. There were hot tub temperatures in Florida. 
and it caused extreme coral bleaching, which essentially just means that there's a breakdown in an essential symbiosis that the corals had, and it leads to them dying if the temperatures don't go back down. So this is very important for brain corals, boulder corals, elkhorn corals, <clears throat> so susceptible to high temperatures. Um, unfortunately, all of you will not survive this unless you have the heat tolerance gene. Um, that one was GTA. If you have that in your bracelet, you guys survive. But otherwise, um, who else is still surviving at this point? <laughs> All right, what kind of corals are you guys? Um, mustard hill. Mustard hill. Mustard hill. Cool. We have a reef full of mustard hill corals. So, <laughs> so this is what the reefs used to look like in the Caribbean. We used to have so many diverse boulder corals, brain corals, elkhorn corals. Um, this is what the reefs mostly look like in the Caribbean now. It looks like a bunch of little mustard hill corals growing on skeletons of other corals. So um, this is really unfortunate. You want to have a lot of different beautiful corals growing on the reef. So there are a lot of coral restoration strategies to try to bring these corals back. So I'm gonna um, introduce you all to the most common, most widely used strategy by many different organizations um, on islands across the Caribbean right now, what we call clonal restoration, or fragmentation because we're essentially just fragmenting corals. And this is how this works. So you have a coral on a barren reef. It's still surviving. And it would be great if it was surviving in other places, not just right there. So the diver comes down. This is a coral restoration practitioner. He sees the healthy coral. And he's gonna wag it with a hammer. <laughs> and it's going to break into two pieces. He's gonna move that piece over there and that's his strategy. So the, the, the scar tissue where he broke it, studies have actually shown it causes the coral to grow marginally faster than it would in the wild, but marginally faster. It's also stressful for the coral to be broken up like that and just be strewn around in places it's not used to. So there's a high chance that these fragments might die but there is a chance it might grow faster than it would have if you left it alone. Plus you could put it in new places that, um, that have no corals. Um, but one of the problems with this strategy, besides what I just mentioned, is that if you can imagine this is a reef where they totally restored this coral from one original coral by fragging it, and it just grew from the scar tissue. Each of these corals are the exact same genetic makeup as the original. They are literally clones which means they have all the same genes, which means they're gonna respond to all of their future environmental change. Potentially, they're gonna respond to it in the same way. So when a new heat wave comes through, they might all bleach at the same time. And then all of that work he did, all of that fragging corals, all of that, all of that restoration work is for nothing because there's no diversity on the reef. There's no diversity in responses to environmental change. Um, but this is the most widely practiced um, method to restore the reefs. And so um, I spent a lot of time on St. Croix and the U.S. Virgin Islands doing research, but also working in coral restoration. Um, and I have some videos of what this process actually looks like. So this is the Nature Conservancy on St. Croix. And these are race, what we call raceways, but they're tanks of filtered seawater, and they're being shaded from the sun. So we go out in the morning, we collect a bunch of corals from the reef, we bring them in here, and then we spend all day fragging them by chopping them up with a saw. And then you can, so I'll lift, I'll lift it up here real quick so you can see the corals that are in there waiting to be fragged. Um, so yeah, they're just like chunks of little boulder corals or brain corals, and they're waiting to be fragged, and we do micro frags. So you wanna have like many raw edges of scar tissue so they grow faster marginally faster, I'll remind you, <laughs> in every direction. Um, and then as soon as that tissue starts to heal a little bit, they might be ready to go um, out, back out onto the reef. But before they can actually just be totally left alone, we put them in these gardens. And these are um, elevated off the ground so they don't get eaten by fish or grown over by algae, but they still have to be gardened, which means that these guys who go out there every single day have to do some weeding to scrape all the algae off because it grows way faster than the coral. So um, these are the little frags that are growing on the table. 
And every day or every other day, the gardeners will go out there and we'd all follow the algae to keep um, the frogs growing safely before they seem to be big enough and then you could just scatter them around. <laughs> and those are the sharks going by? Those are dolphins. So this is actually a really cool site um, because these dolphins, they love the sound of the hammer. They think it's really funny. And so when you start using the hammer sound, they come by and they're like, I mean, you, I don't want to anthropomorphize them, but they do a little smile. <laughs> so it's, it is pretty cool to work down in the coral gardens um, because that, that pod is just always there. Um, okay, that's the first restoration strategy. But most places are trying to figure out a better way because we all can see the shortfalls in the first strategy. So the second way is what we would call larval restoration or coral breeding. And essentially what this does is it um, uses uh, what I call the genetic toolbox in my title. So your DNA, you might be familiar with this molecule. You all have it. It's in all, every single one of your cells. If you stretch it out, it looks like this, but not as colorful. It's made of these um, uh, molecules that have long names, but for short we'll call them G, A, T, and C. Just those four strung together in a very unique way that's very unique to you. Um, and it's extremely long. It just goes on and on and on because each of these sequences um, composes genes. And those genes decide what you look like, how you respond to your environment, every single thing about you. Um, and you inherit half of them from your mom and half of them from your dad, but there's also chances for it to mutate. And when you mutate, you could potentially develop new characteristics and make you respond differently to the environment, which is better than everybody else to the environment. So to demonstrate that, I think we should play a quick game of telephone. Yay. So I think you all know how the game of telephone works. Um, you'll just, I'll start from this side. Um, I have these prompts for you. So um, just take the one on top and you can pass it back. So this side of the room, um, don't show it to the person next to you. But she'll whisper it to that person. If you don't know that person and you don't want to spread germs, just cover your mouth. Um, but then keep spreading it all this way, hop across the aisle, and keep spreading it this way. And then I'm going to touch base with all of you to see what you guys heard. Ooh. So go ahead.
you might develop a mutation. So you started out on this side with the nucleus of flute, or the nucleus of flute, and I think you actually made it to the end, so no mutations, because they happen very slowly. Yeah. But I think on this side, we might have lost some words going all the way to the end, and that's like what we, a mutation we would call like a deletion, you lose a gene or something. That happens in real life. Um, and sometimes these are helpful for you, sometimes they're not. In real life, actually, there's a higher chance you'll receive bad mutations than good mutations because the chance you're going to develop a mutation that makes you respond better than everybody else to your environmental change is very slim. So I guess another quick thing I wanted to demonstrate is that if you um, had some mutations, if you, okay, I have a few dice in this box right here, and we'll just do the first two rows. Um, if you could roll these dice, if you roll a one, you have a good mutation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, you have a one. So your family line survives, so good job. <laughs> so we'll do one more. Probably. Got a one. You have a one too? Oh good, great. So you guys, you guys all survived. Your mutations were very helpful for you. If any of you hadn't rolled a one, we would have assumed that you're, you inherited bad mutations up in your family line and your family line would have died with you. So, <laughs> this, is, this is really, really hard to try to improve like a coral population with mutations because they happen so rarely they breed only once a year so the chance for them to arise is very small the chance that they're going to be good for you is even smaller um another way that we can improve um we can help the corals to adapt is through migration which essentially just means that you pick up one coral from one population it has all the genes from this one we're going to move it to that population to try to introduce um some more genes um, we also can assist gene flow um, if we can harness um, the spawning events, cross them, and produce novel genes that probably wouldn't have occurred naturally in the environment, um, and then I'll plant those back onto the reef. So this is, this is actually the example of what we were trying to do. So in St. Croix, here's a video of what that looks like. So this is a elkhorn coral. It's during the night, exactly at that time I mentioned before, where these divers have known elkhorns spawn at this time of night on this day of the year. And they went down with this net. And they put the net around the branches of the coral. And so as soon as it spawns, all of the spawn is going to go up and be caught in the net. And it's going to be caught in that little tube at the top with the blue cap. And you're just going to catch it all up there. Um, and then you're going to bring that container back to the lab and you're gonna pour everybody in a bucket, or all the little games in a bucket, all the eggs in a bucket, and you're gonna allow them to develop in a very protected, closed tub of water um, on land. And within a few hours, you'll have little larvae. So these larvae are like novel combinations of genes of corals that probably wouldn't have survived in the wild, but we're protecting them on land. Um, they're, as you can see, they're really, really small. And this happens just in a few hours. It's such a fast process. Given um, a few more hours to maybe a day, they'll start to elongate, and you can see now these larvae are making conscious decisions. They're receiving cues from the environment and from their developmental stage that they need to start diving and looking for a place to settle. They need to find a spot on the reef to calcify, stick down, and that's where they're gonna live forever. Um, once they start to show this type of behavior, <laughs> well, you wanna give them something to settle on that's not a petri dish, because you can't once they're on a petri dish, you can't put them back on the reef. So we give them these ceramic ninja stars, is what we call them. And they're covered in all of these groups because the larvae love to settle in these little protected groups. And if you can see, they're really, really tiny. They're these tiny little specks, those are them. They find the perfect spot, they think is the perfect spot on the, on the star, and then they start to settle down and they calcify. And um, once, that happens a few days later you can see they start to grow and they develop these little tentacles in their little mouth and at this point they might be ready to be outplanted back on the reef so we'll string together all of the ninja stars and here we put them like on a piece of rebar and put that into the reef near this is the reef where their parents are from so these are all little baby brain corals put back onto their parents reef it's a really dirty reef, so you can see all the algae on the bottom, so we like, wanted to lift them up off the reef so they didn't get overgrown. But 
we'll let them grow out there for a year and then within a year if we go back and check and we pull those reefs or we pull the pull those stars off the bar you can see the stars overgrew with algae but this is what a one-year-old coral looks like so on the left we have a brain coral is starting to develop that first groove and the little polyps are inside on the right we have a mustard hill coral where you can see he has like maybe three or more polyps already after one year it's not a lot they grow really really slow but this is um as much as a coral can grow in one year when they're um, protected. So this is the ultimate goal at the moment. This is the best that um, restoration is able to provide for the corals is to at least try to increase the genetic diversity through breeding and creating novel combinations of genes that you can outline onto the reef instead of just spreading around a bunch of clones. So um, in conclusion, we talked about how many coral reefs are declining, especially in the Caribbean. The Caribbean is really going through it right now, more so than many other places in the world. Um, corals reproduce by spawning, and this is a very precise event that happens in the night, in the summer, um, viewed by the full moon and the time of sunset, and all of the corals of the same species know within a 20 minute window to release all of their um, eggs at once. Um, fragmentation leads to clonal reefs. So this is if you chop a coral into many pieces and just scatter it around, all those corals have the same genes. They're going to respond to environmental change in the same way. But genetic diversity is good. So having different, different genes across the reef allows them to have different responses to the environment. So whatever change happens, they'll have a better chance, you'll have a better chance of at least one of them surviving. And by breeding corals, we can increase the genetic diversity on the reef. And so that is the coral restoration strategy that we're trying to um, work on and improve right now. So the last thing I have for you all today is a quiz. So this is back using this same QR code. If you guys are on the same page, it should have changed. All right, first question. Um, which animals are not closely related to corals? And for people who want like a specific definition, I mean not in the same phylum. Which, which animals are not closely related to corals? So you guys have 30 seconds. Your options are sea fans, jellyfish, anemones, sponges, or sea whips. Okay, gotcha. All right, let's check the answer. There are lots of jellyfish. The correct answer is sponges. So jellyfish and anemones both have the same coral, the same body as the coral with the tentacles and the mouth in the middle. They're all in the same phyla called nigarians. Sponges are the only ones that are totally different. They don't have any of those features. Uh, which kind of corals are increasing in the Caribbean? So your options are elkhorn, mustard hill, star coral, bright coral, boulder coral. Oh, it looks like only anthropoids have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, mustard hills are the winners in the Caribbean. Oh, there's the winners. Okay, well, here's the... <laughs> Um, how, do, how does a coral know when to spawn? So which of these are cues? Is it the full moon, summer temperature, time of sunset, increased fish activity, or food availability? There's more than one right answer here, so just pick one. All right, all the answers have come in. The full moon is correct. Hot summer temperatures are correct. Time of sunset is correct because they need to have that window of the sun going down, a period of darkness, and then they see the moon rise. Fish activity and food availability doesn't impact on the spots. You guys are correct. Good job to whoever guessed 620 is. You guys, you're doing the best for right now. Um, which restoration strategy increases genetic diversity? Clonal or larval? Fragmentation or breeding? Okay, all the answers have come in. Good job, everybody.
Breeding increases genetic diversity. <gasps> yes, 620, you lost your lead. <laughs> okay, how can corals adapt to climate change? Outplanting coral fragments, DNA mutations, migration and gene flow, or providing shade from the sun. There's more than one right answer here, so just sort of pick one of them. All right, all the answers are in. Yeah. So the, the correct answers are mutations, migration, and gene flow. Those are all of the things that will increase the, genet the genetic diversity in the tree. So <laughs> does the guess 617? OK. <laughs> yeah, <stop>. uh, <laughs> that's her fight. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you. I want to say thank you to everybody in the math lab who's been able to help me with um, all of my research and learning everything. Also, thank you to everybody that was from the Nature Conservancy. They uh, really taught me everything um, that I, and, yeah, showed me how to do all of this. The last thing I want to uh, plug real quick before I take any questions is that if you guys are interested in corals, um, a friend of the lab, Julie Burwald, she's a local author. She's going to give a talk um, next week on Wednesday, March 27th at 3 p.m at UT Austin. Um, NHB is a building at UT Austin in front of the um, big statue of the canoes um, room 1.72. She's a really great speaker. Um, I highly recommend you all take out her talk to you. So yeah, thank you guys and I'll take any questions. first enter the coral and can that be selectively bred? So that depends. For these, for the example I was giving the broadcast spawners where they just put everything onto the water, they'll receive that from their environment. So after they settle, they'll just receive 
whatever algae um, symbionts are around them. But some of the corals, like the mustard hill actually, um, they do spawn, but in a different way. They'll actually like still retain their larvae inside them and then let them out, and they'll give their larvae their algal symbiont. So that happens vertically instead of horizontally. So it's, um, yeah, it depends on the type of species, but for the most part, they cannot take it from the environment. Yeah? I'm imagining that after a coral spawns, if that's the right <laughs> conjugation, um, a lot of the larvae gets lost or eaten. Yeah. Do you have a percentage on that? And comparatively, how many you're able to make, um, are, are you able to just thrive in mm -hmm. lab versus in the wild? It's hard to measure it in the wild, but we know that, yeah, you're right, it's probably one in a million or smaller, because um, I don't know if you were able to see in the video of the spawning, but there were so many worms just like spinning all around. It's a feeding frenzy too. So the I've, all the other animals in the environment know this is a great time to get a bunch of protein. Um, so yeah, the, the chance that they'll actually survive that on their own in the wild is very slim. The chance that they'll survive it in the lab, you could see that like as how many larvae were on that little drop on the petri dish that was just pulled out of a tub from like a, a dropper. So we can get a lot of them to survive to that stage, but a lot, a lot of them might die before they settle, and then a lot of them might die after they settle before they go on the reef, and then there will be another stage of death as adapting to the reef. So. It's, there, it's really hard all the way, all along the way. There's also a possibility that there's a lot of bad mutations in many of them that we can't control for. So um, I don't know the difference between what we can do in the lab versus what happens in the wild, but we know that in the lab we can at least protect them from like the predators and the currents and everywhere they can be blown, that doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, you're, you're right that most of them will survive. Yeah. Um, in the video, is the larvae actually able to move by themselves, or is it like the current? Yeah, they, they're they swimming. They have little, uh, silly. Yeah. Other than their intrinsic value, why do we care about corals? <laughs> they, yeah, they provide a lot of habitat for many other species. Like invertebrates and fish all live in the structures and the branches and like all the different plates that the bouldering corals provide. They provide all this structure and the Florida Keys is actually a really good example of what that um, environment looks like when all the reefs die because it erodes into sand and it just becomes flat and it's pretty much the Florida Keys right now is just sea fans. Just sea fans on flat sand for as far as you can see but um, the pictures I show them where there's like all these different boulders and structures for all these different animals to hide in, they, they really need that. In, in agriculture, a lot of crops are like selectively bred for more favorable traits and different like diseases and things, or tolerance to climate. Is that something that's possible with corals? Yeah, actually, that's something that they're, well, our lab is kind of trying, many other labs are also really trying to do. One of the most popular experiments you can do with coral is put them all in a hot bucket and see who survives and breed them. <laughs> so you want to try to select for the good genes in a way that's going to be useful for the environment. If they can withstand hot temperatures, they're probably strong in some way. Let's harness those genes. So that's one of the ways that we can try to try to improve coral breeding. All right, well, if you have any other questions, feel free to come up and talk afterwards. But thank you guys again for coming out. Thank you.